Good morning and welcome to Kelly Baptist Church on August the 2nd, year of our Lord 2020. Again, I'll say and remind us that time is fleeting and school is about to start and we're still in the uh, crisis of the Chinese virus that's going around and we're still dealing with the ramifications of that. But we're going to worship the Lord. We're going to worship Him all over this country through this message today. We want to remember the uh, sick and afflicted of our community. We want to especially remember the needs of Miss Rachel Dennison who lost her home Friday night in a house fire. If you're going to send a special love offering, not your tithing offerings, you send that to the church. But if you want to send a special love offering to Miss Rachel Dennison, make your check out to Kelly Baptist Church and on the 4 FOR line at the bottom, put Miss Rachel Dennison. And all of that will be collected separately and go straight to her benevolence fund. And we want to encourage you to do that. But don't take what you, your tithes and offerings are and make it separate. Don't designate that. Keep giving your tithes and offerings for the ministry to get this message out. And we as a church are going to surround Miss Rachel and take care of all of her needs because she's uh, the biblical recipient of what we are to do as Christians. Don't forget to pray for her. This morning we're going to talk about uh, what a lot of others have made confusing. It's a topic uh, that Jesus taught specifically in parables in the Bible. And it refers to the called and the chosen. The called and the chosen. And he uses the parable of a wedding feast in which the king invites people from the community and special people to the uh, wedding feast for his son. Now I want to give you some background on that. There was a movie in 2005 called The Wedding Crashers. I did not watch that movie, but I remember the uh, movie trailers for it and the actors in it are very famous and I think it was about these two guys and then there were others who would go around crashing weddings to which they were not invited and they would eat and take part of the fellowship and they would even pretend to know the bride and groom and they would take a microphone and say nice things about them and everyone was too embarrassed to call them out on it and out of that came this dramatic interrelationships with people, but it was about the wedding crashers. So I titled my sermon today, Are You the Chosen, the Called, the Chosen, or the Wedding Crashers? Because we're going to see all three of these in the parable that Jesus taught, the great wedding feast, in Matthew chapter 22. Now one thing that made Jesus such a great teacher was his use of parables. Let me tell you what a parable is. It's an earthly story, something that a story relates to of earthly things. And he was telling this parable to the Pharisees so they knew exactly what he was talking about. But it had a heavenly meaning. And Jesus' words were so effective even to this day, through this day, because we can all relate to the parables because they... Uh, relate to us individually in our everyday lives. Parables have a double meaning. First, there's the literal meaning, the actual wedding, the, the guest, the feast, those things that go with it. Then there's the deeper meaning, the beneath the surface meaning. And today we're going to address both and, and simplify and make understandable the parable of the marriage of the king's son. There are two Bible words that are pivotal in this scripture that are misused and misinterpreted and mispreached through the Calvinist view. And it's the heart of it. It's the called and the chosen. And we're going to teach what Jesus said so that we will dispute what has been taught, as, it's, which is heretical. Calvinism says that before time began, Watch Wednesday night service. You got this down clearly. Before time began, God went through and put in the Lamb's Book of Life, 
before time began, those who would live on earth and picked out the ones he would save, put them in the book. And then he picked out the ones who would go straight to hell. And neither group could change their destination. That's what Calvinists believe and teach. During each chosen person's life, God sends a call to him to get saved. To a Calvinist, a call is a command. Calvinists believe that when God calls people, those specific people have no choice. They will say yes and be saved because God is sovereign and we believe God is sovereign and we're not Calvinists. But they believe that no one can say no to the calling of the Holy Spirit. The Calvinists would say that few are called and everyone on the list is chosen. But that's not what Jesus said. He did not say that. Jesus said many are called, but few are chosen. And he's going to say that in today's parable. Let's read together the parable of the wedding feast from Matthew 22, 1 through 14. Then we're going to break it down and we're going to get the earthly meaning and we're going to get the heavenly meaning. Because Jesus Christ himself began saying, the kingdom of heaven is like. And that's what we love to see. He's making a comparison here that we're going to get to understand what he, what he means and what's going on. How do we get into the kingdom of heaven? So stand together at home as a family or individually and hold the word of God and we're going to read together, read aloud from Matthew 22, 1 through 14, the parable of the wedding feast. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again in parables. And he said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king. Now think of the king as Father God, who arranged a marriage for his son. Now who did God arrange a marriage for Jesus? The church. We were the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Christ for Jesus the groom. And he sent out his servants to call those who were, who were invited to the wedding. And they were not willing to come. Now who does God send out to invite others to be a part of the bride of Christ, a part of the church? He sends you. He sends me. He sent me to preach this message. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, he sends his missionaries out. And all are invited to come and take part in the wedding feast. Just like this parable. They, but the Bible says they were not willing to come, that first group. Again, he sent out other servants. He sent out some more. And he said, tell those who are invited, see, the dinner's prepared. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed. And all things are ready. The meat's cooked. It's ready to sit down and eat. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it. And they went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest, listen to this, seized his servants and treated them spitefully and killed the servants that God sent out to invite, or the king sent out to invite all of the world, all of those guests to come in freely to the great feast. Now this is the parable of what it's, the kingdom of God is like. And it's exactly as Jesus is telling this. Then, the Bible says in verse 7, but when the king heard about it, now think about when God found out about it, he was furious and he sent out his armies and he destroyed the murderers and he burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, Now the wedding is ready. But those who were invited, who would not come, who kill my servants, are not worthy. Therefore, now go into the highways and the byways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding of my son. So those servants went out into the highways and they gathered all whom they found good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. 
But when the came, king came in to see the guest, when God looked into who's trying to get into the wedding feast of the Lamb, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. He was not part of the group. He had not been clothed for the wedding. And I might let you compare that to he had not been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And that's the only way we're going to get into the kingdom of heaven is to be washed in the blood of the Lamb and to accept it and recognize Jesus Christ is the only way. So he, God, the king, said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? You're not getting into heaven unless you're washed in the blood of the Lamb. And the man was speechless because he had no answer. And the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning and we are reading with all sincerity, with great intent and seriousness, what you want us to know about the wedding feast and those who were invited who rejected you and those who killed the very servants who brought forth the wedding invitation to come to the wedding of Jesus Christ and to be part of his bride those martyrs. And then, Lord, the one who even snuck into the wedding or tried to sneak into the wedding, and God said, there will be no unrighteousness in my house. And he was cast out where there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then we'd like for you, Lord, to let us know and firmly understand what does it mean what Jesus said, for many are called, but few are chosen. Please divide the word of truth today that we would understand it. In thy name, Jesus Christ, our Savior and groom, we are your bride, we pray. Amen. Who are the chosen people in this parable? Listen closely. The chosen people are those who came to the marriage and came in the right way. They weren't just invited. They came in and they came in the right way. The man who was not wearing a wedding garment when he came, he snuck in. He came in the wrong way. The only way to God is through trusting Jesus Christ. There is no other way. You can't do good. You can't pretend. You can't put on your own earthly works, your earthly clothes. No way can you get into heaven except through Jesus Christ. Some may say yes to the call. But only those who say yes to Jesus are chosen. Now, other religions and theologies have mixed up these definitions that Jesus is giving us about called and chosen. And he's making it clear for us here. The overall message of this parable is that the people the king chose rejected God and ended up being not chosen because the people the king did not initially choose accepted him and ended up being chosen. Now who did God first choose to be his chosen nation? Began from the loins of one man. His name was Abraham. And out of him was born the Jewish nation. God's chosen people. You can like that or not like that. But that's the Bible. For the Bible says that he came, Jesus came first to the Jews, but also to the Greeks and the Gentiles. You and I are, I don't know all of you, but everybody I know in our Kelly Church is not a Jew. We are Gentiles. Jesus came first to the Jew, but he also came from, for us. And that's what this parable is explaining to us. It illustrates... What Jesus is saying, the kingdom of heaven is like to. This parable is how to get into the kingdom of heaven. If you don't know how to get into the kingdom of heaven, this parable is going to teach you how. As a side note, we believe that God is sovereign. Raise your hand if you believe God is sovereign. Wave it at me. I see that hand. God is sovereign. 
Now the Calvinist would say because he's sovereign, he chose who's going to be saved and he chose who's going to go to hell. They have minimized the sovereignty of God. God is so sovereign, he so defines his sovereignty, that his sovereignty it displays the fact that he allows you to choose. Now only a sovereign God could allow his creation to choose him or reject him. Love cannot be forced. Love can be imitated, but passion can be forced, but you can't make somebody love you. It's a choice. If I go down the road and let's pretend I weren't married to Judy and, and I were a single young man and I see a beautiful young woman and I decide I'm going to marry her, I could take a gun and I could have a thug with a Bible and I could hold the gun to her head and make her say yes and marry me. That's not love. That's not a choice. Or I could do like I did with Judy and get on my knees and tell her I loved her with all my heart and she could fall in love with me and she could voluntarily say yes. That's the difference in what the Calvinists teach and what Jesus said. Because God's sovereignty is so sovereign that only He could give us a choice. Now we must live with that choice we make, but it's a choice He gives us. The Calvinists have taken this definition and they have changed it. God has given man a free will. Amen? And allowed man to be sovereign over his own life. And that sovereignty with which we each have a choice to explicate in our lives is the choice of free will. Our sovereignty is going to yield sooner or later in the total sovereignty of God because in His total sovereignty at the end of the book everybody pays the price. The price is either what Jesus paid for me to go to heaven or the price I choose to pay and I choose to go to hell. That actually is what manifests and explicates the great sovereignty of God. God controls a person's surroundings and He can end a person's life when He chooses or He can extend it when He chooses. That's why we pray. Because God is a God who's sovereign and He can do what He will do. And we know that and we trust Him because He loves us. So who are the called? What did Jesus' parables say about the called person? A called person is someone who has been invited. The Bible tells us all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. And Jesus would that all would be saved. That's his, what he would like. The truth is that most people who receive the call do not accept it. Israel rejected Jesus, rejected God, Yahweh, over and over and over. And they were called. I have seen people hear the gospel and sweat blood rather than accepting Jesus Christ as Savior, knowing the power of the Holy Ghost was upon them and rejected Him. The truth is that most people who receive the call don't accept it. The Bible says that there will be relatively few in heaven. They say no to it. I'm not coming up with that theology I'm quoting Jesus Christ. Many are called, few are chosen. A call or in, an invitation can come from God, but it can also come from God through people, through His Word. We make these little tracks and leave them around here and there. For a lot of people have been saved from reading a track. The power of God cuts like a two-edged sword through His Word. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ Himself is that Word. But most importantly, God has informed us. And Jesus told us as He went up into the clouds before the uh, disciples that He would send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit of God 
is who works through us and through the tracts and through the Bible in order to draw the unsaved to Jesus Christ. Now, if anybody says that no one can reject the Holy Spirit, they are blaspheming God because they then change the very definition of salvation. It's a choice. And one can reject the Holy Spirit, but there's a price to be paid because at the great white throne of judgment, those who reject the Holy Spirit will receive their rewards for the unpardonable sin. There is one unpardonable sin, and it's the rejection of the Holy Spirit's invitation to be saved by Jesus Christ on the cross. Now those who say, you have no choice, God ordained and foredecided that you're going to be saved and you're going to be lost and go to hell, that is not the message of the gospel. And I'm here to tell you, I stand on the word of Jesus Christ today. The goal of the gospel is to reach everyone with the call, every creature, all nations, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, as Jesus himself commanded in the Great Commission. All right, that's the call, all of us. Now, who are the chosen? First, only certain people were chosen in the first part of the parable. Remember that? He sent out his servants to remind the chosen, don't you be late for the wedding. You know who those are? Those are the Jews. Jesus Christ was a Jew, and God chose the Jewish nation to first receive him. And the initial plan was they would be the great missionary vehicle for all the world to be saved, but they rejected him, just like in this parable. The first group that the servants went out to said, I'm going to my farm, I'm going to my business. And, and, and they went about their own way rejecting the invitation. The Jews rejected Yahweh God over and over. This is a selection of a kind. The Romans 11, 25, 11, 5. Everyone who will may come. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever will believe in him may not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever, all who will. The intention was for the elected first group, the Jews, to spread the gospel to everybody else. But when the Jews wouldn't do it, God did it anyway. And we're going to see how he did it. And he used this parable, Matthew 22, to explain to us most of the people that the king and the householder chose to call did not become chosen people. We have the called and the chosen. That's who Jesus is describing. Consider what happens when you choose someone to do something for you. Even though you chose him, that does not mean he will become the chosen one. I can choose someone to be my wife. That doesn't mean she will choose to be my wife. I can choose to be her husband, but she may not choose to be my wife. Therefore, she never becomes my wife. The chosen person must say yes to the choosing and start doing what you choose him to do before he actually is the chosen one. The chosen one becomes the chosen one at the acceptance of the invitation, which is specific to serve Jesus Christ. Now, some people think, yeah, I'm saved because I walked down the aisle and I got baptized. I can't tell you how many people have told me I want to be baptized. Now what some of them mean is I really want to be saved. And we have to go through and I have to make sure they understand they're repenting of their sin. But some people think that going under the water is salvation. No! To be chosen is to accept the yoke of Jesus Christ to accept that God himself from heaven came to that cross, allowed those people to kill him, and his shed blood is the only thing that will be your shining white garment to let you into the wedding feast that's going to occur in heaven. 
And those who haven't accepted Him and lived a life for Him of fruit will be bound head and foot and thrown into everlasting darkness and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Chosen are those who choose from the invitation to accept Jesus. Judy is my wife, not because I invited her to marry me, but because she chose me through the invitation to be Mrs. Joe Aguiar and to live with me as husband and wife and raise our children. She didn't come by invitation and say, yeah, I'll, I'll come. And we had a wedding ceremony and she left and went to Greece and I never saw her again. That's not choosing to be my wife. When she chose to be my wife, she accepted that role as Mrs. Joe Aguilar. And when we accept the invitation through the power of the Holy Spirit to be the bride of Jesus Christ, we accept a role and a definition and we become the chosen. The chosen are those who accept Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection, that He is God Himself, and that He's coming back to get me to bring Him to be with Him, and we're going to honeymoon for seven years during that tribulation, having a feast, and which will continue for eternity. That's what chosen means. Doesn't that help you clear that up? I do not know who made up this thread of thought. I can't even blame John Calvin back in the 1500s, although he did a lot to perpetuate it. Where God before the time began sat down, he looked out into the future of eternity and everyone who would ever be conceived and born and everything would happen on the yet to be created earth decides who will go to heaven and who will go to hell. I know God knew that, but there's nowhere in the Bible that says He decided which ones He's going to torture in hell without them having a choice. That is not in the Bible. And the, and the person who can tell me that is not alive because it's not in there. The Bible does describe a time when God chooses those who will go to heaven and those who will go to hell. But it's not the time before time begins. It's at the great white throne of judgment. Read with me Matthew 25. We'll look at verse 31 through 46. Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate them one from the other as a shepherd divides his sheep from his goats. This division did not happen at the beginning of time before the earth was formed. It happens at the great white throne of judgment. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, that's the heavenly believers, and the goats on the left, that's the unbelievers going to hell. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come! You blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. It doesn't say I chose you to be on the list from the foundation of the world. It says I prepared heaven for you from the foundation of the world. Can you imagine how great heaven's going to be? Because God has worked on it for so long. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to see me. Then the righteous, the believers, those who've accepted Jesus, who allowed themselves and said, yes, I want to be the chosen and I'm going to live like it, say, Lord, when did we come to you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, Inasmuch as you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. You see, what God is saying is when you accept my invitation, 
to marry my son Jesus Christ, to become his bride, and to live as his spouse, you then live like that, and that very spirit of God that lives within you sought out all those who need to be served because you become the greatest servant because you have accepted the call through the invitation. But he will also say to those on the left hand, the goats, depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That fiery brimstone was not prepared and created for mankind. There will be mankind there, but God created it for the devil and his demons. And if you choose to reject Jesus Christ, because you've been invited, and you didn't accept the call and lived the spousal life of Jesus Christ, the bride of Jesus Christ, you are choosing to join the devil and his demons in hell because it was prepared for them and not for you. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. You lived like the devil, so to speak. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. I was naked and freezing to death and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And God will answer them saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment with weeping and gnashing of teeth, but the righteous into eternal life. You have a choice and a sovereign God in heaven today because he is so sovereign laid that choice before you. The Calvinists would tell you you have no choice. God decided it for you. Live like the devil because it doesn't matter. If your name's in the book of life, you can't go to hell. There's nothing you can do. Or if your name is in the book of death, live like the devil anyway because you're going to have a little short time to enjoy it so you may as well. And that is not what the Bible says and that is not what Matthew 22 is saying. The chosen are those who have been invited from the whole world to choose to be the bride of Jesus Christ and live as his bride. Are you living for Jesus? You can't live for Him if you've never married Him. You cannot live for Him if you did not accept His invitation to be His spouse and to live a life only dedicated to Him. Some people try to say, yeah, I'll, I'll go to church, but in the week I'm going to do what I want to. That's not being chosen. That is not living the life of the chosen. What you've done is keep your old life and you take on a false label, but you, you put on the sheep's wool on the outside like the righteous, but underneath you're still a goat. And God knows who his people are. He said, I am the great shepherd. I know my sheep. When my sheep hear my voice, they know my voice and they follow me. The goats aren't going to follow him, but the sheep are because they chose him from the invitation from him. After his death and resurrection, God then continued to work through Peter, Paul, and the disciples to show the non-Jews, you and me, the Gentiles, we could be children of God too. All we had to do was trust Jesus. He came first to the Jew, but then he also came to the Greek and the Gentile. All of a sudden, God's people shifted from the Jews to those, to all of those simply who trusted Jesus. It was obvious that the Jews could no longer be considered the chosen, the only chosen, because those who trusted Jesus were the chosen. So now we look at a world, looking back in hindsight, where just like the parable, the first group rejected the servant's invitation to the wedding feast. No, I got foreman to do. No, I got business to do. That's the Jews. And then... The Gentiles were invited. So you see by now, the whole world has been invited to become part of the chosen family of God, the bride of Christ. 
Many are called. Few are chosen. Few become chosen because they reject Jesus Christ. Mark 13, 20 tells us, And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect, the chosen sake, whom He hath chosen, He hath shortened the days. Now let's explain this, because it is the spike in the heart of the Calvinist narrative. It kills the very Calvinist theology. Jesus teaches that all believers, dead and living, will be raptured before this terrible time, this tribulation, in which God shortens the day. So all believers, those who already died, their bodies will come up out of the grave. Those who are living at the rapture will join and meet them in the air, and then we're up in heaven with Jesus at the wedding feast of the Lamb. You got that? Now we're past that. This is during the great tribulation period. And God says that it's so bad that except for the chosen, the elect, those who become saved, wait a minute, but their name wasn't in the book of life from the beginning of time, like the Calvinists say. Wait a minute, I don't understand this. If their name was in the book of life, they would have been raptured. So there were people who were not accepted, not chosen, because they accepted the role, who were raptured, and then after that, those who remained alive on earth were part of the tribulation, and the Bible says that God shortened the days so that those could accept Him and be the chosen part of the bride of Christ. The Calvinists can't argue with that because if God wrote down every name in that book and nobody had a choice, they'd have been raptured too. But they weren't because they still had time to accept Jesus Christ as Savior. And they weren't raptured. They weren't saved. But God shortened the days and He gave them a chance to be part of the chosen. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus shall we be with Him always. When that happens, there's going to be some people left on earth who are not saved who are not Christians, who are not the chosen. And God said tribulation will set in and He will shorten the days so that those can still accept Him and be saved even if they become martyred and their heads cut off. Folks, God's gracious gospel is for everyone. He didn't pick some on either side and send you to heaven or send you to hell. If He did, that cross is meaningless. It's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit of God to say that Jesus Christ died for nothing because God pre-chose it all ahead of time. If the Calvinist narrative says that all to be saved are written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world and they have no choice, they cannot explain how people get saved during the tribulation because they would have been brought to heaven already because of their claim that all of the elect are in heaven already from the rapture that we I just read to you in 1 Thessalonians. Why would Jesus, why would God Himself seal 144,000 Jewish missionaries to go throughout the world during the tribulation while we're in heaven to get those people saved? Why would He appoint two witnesses, Elijah and Moses, set them at the temple gates, to share the gospel for those three and a half years if he didn't want people saved. Folks, he gives us a choice and if you want to be chosen, you choose to be part of the chosen from the invitation that God has given over and over and over. Revelation 7, 13 through 14 tells us about those 144,000 Jews. One of the, the greatest missionaries that ever lived. One of the elders answered saying unto me, this is John up in heaven, talking to an elder in heaven. What are these which are arrayed in white robes, the right covered in the righteousness of Jesus? And where did they come from? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, 
They are they which came out of the great tribulation. They were saved during the tribulation. People are going to be saved during the tribulation. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The Calvinism theology has just been proven to be a lie from hell. Because they would tell you that everybody who's in the Lamb's book of life would already have been in heaven and nobody can be saved during the tribulation. Which is a lie because the Bible just told us there are countless people standing before the throne of God who accepted him. But I want to tell you, once you die without Jesus Christ, there's no other chance. If you die tonight without Jesus Christ, you will not be in that great crowd of witnesses clothed in white before the Father. You will be standing ready for your judgment of how hot your hell is going to be from how many times you rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. Called people are those who are invited or asked to get saved and it's the whole world. Chosen people are those who trust Jesus Christ and ask to become his bride. For his crime against the king, the improperly attired guest, and I showed you a picture of it, was bound head and foot and thrown into outer darkness. In other words, many people hear the call. He heard the call, but he tried to sneak in without being righteous before Jesus Christ and accepting his righteousness to cover him. You can't sneak into heaven. You can't get in there by works. God knows everything and there will not be a lie nor a sin in he heaven. All will be cast into outer darkness who are not part of the bride of Christ. Is Christianity elite? You better believe it is. Is Christianity exclusive? You better believe it is. Is there one exclusive way to be a Christian and get to heaven? You better believe it and it's Jesus Christ plus nothing. Amen. And it's not about who wrote your name, when and where. It's about when you accepted to be the chosen one of Jesus Christ to live for him and be his spouse and recognize him as the Savior, God and King. Let me summarize this parable. God sent his son into the world. The very people who should have celebrated his coming rejected him, the Jews, bringing judgment upon themselves. As a result, the kingdom of heaven was opened up to anyone and everyone who will set aside his own righteousness and take on the righteousness only of Jesus Christ. That's you and me, the Gentiles. By faith, accept the righteousness God provides in Christ. And those who spurn the gift of salvation and cling instead to their own good works like the wedding crasher will spend eternity in hell whether they're Jew or Gentile. There'll be a lot of Jews in hell. There'll be a lot of Jews in heaven. But only those who are the chosen, who accept Him as the Messiah and agree to His marriage proposal will be in heaven. The Jews were God's elect, but they rejected Him and therefore invited the whole world to become the bride of Christ. Many are called, few are chosen. Few accept his invitation and accept the responsibility, the title and the role of Lord, Savior, God and King. Jesus was speaking to the self-righteous Pharisees and they knew exactly what he was talking about and they could not argue with his parable even though they were too prideful to accept that this man standing before them was God himself. The parable of the wedding feast is a warning to us to make sure we are relying on God's provision of salvation and not our good works or our rigid religiosity. Religiosity won't get you to heaven. It'll get you to hell very quickly. The other alternative is to be bound head and foot like the wedding crasher and thrown into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Stephen said as he was being stoned to death, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. What Stephen was saying was, the Holy Spirit has been sent by God to draw you to Him 
to accept him in the role of being the spouse of Jesus Christ. He's your Savior. And when you reject the Holy Spirit, it's the unpardonable sin. Because you cannot get to Jesus Christ without accepting the invitation to become the chosen of Jesus Christ. It's one way or the other. And Stephen gave his life preaching that. I want to ask you today, are you a part of the wedding party or are you a wedding crasher? You're one or the other. Jesus said there would be the sheep on the right side and the goats on the left. And there's no mixing them up. It doesn't matter how hard you try to bleed like a, like a sheep. If you're a goat, you're going to be found out. You'll be thrown out, bound head and foot into the fiery lake of hell. I want to beg you today, choose Jesus. Don't just say it. Live it. Become his spouse, his bride. Don't just take on a title. Take on a role of the bride of Jesus Christ today. For many are called, but only a few are chosen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this parable that so clearly defines for us how we can become a child of God. It's not just to look at you. It's not just to crash the party and sample the food like that movie was, The Wedding Crashers. But it is to become, from the invitation, the chosen and live the life that Jesus Christ would have us live through His righteousness, not our own earthly works. I pray that all who hear this would understand and know it's a choice. And only the great sovereignty of God, Yahweh Himself, is great enough to give us the choice of whosoever will may come. I pray you'd spread this throughout the land and a great harvest would be reaped for those who would give their lives. Give their lives to Jesus Christ. In thy precious holy name, Messiah, King Jesus, I pray. Amen.